Thank you everyone for joining this, uh, us this afternoon for this discussion of social movement organizing, democratic voice and justice in the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Arkan Fung and I direct the democracy programs here at the Ash Center of the Harvard Kennedy School. Like many folks joining this afternoon, I imagine, I've been cooped up in my house for the last six weeks practicing physical distancing. I've been ordering groceries and occasionally takeout. We've ordered things on Amazon like home material, uh, home repair materials and gear to make it easier to work at home and cleaning supplies. Perhaps like you, I've often, or maybe you are one of uh, these people who's still working, I've often thought about the millions of people, by some counts, 40% of America who are essential workers. They've been working throughout this lockdown. These folks have jobs that don't permit them to socially distance. Uh, and many of them are in the gig economy, or as my friend David Weil says, the fissured workplace, in jobs where they don't have much paid sick leave, much savings to protect themselves from layoffs or income dry spells, or even much protective personal equipment at work. Many of them live in low-income communities and communities of color, which are, as we know, are more vulnerable to COVID-19. According to one report, 80% of people who've been hospitalized for COVID in Georgia are Black. It seems that this disease is amplifying many of America's large and unjust pre-existing social health and economic inequalities. Today's discussion is about whether we could transform the arc of this pandemic injustice into some sort of a measure of justice for workers, low-income people, and communities of color. We're incredibly fortunate to have three social movement leaders who are trying to do just this. In a moment, we'll learn what their members want and need most in this pandemic and what they are doing to fight, to fight for social justice. But first, a few brief introductions. Uh, we're joined by Latasha Brown, who is the uh, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Her work aims to empower communities of color through political organizing, especially in the deep south of the United States. In recent weeks, Latasha has been organizing to increase protections for people and communities of color in Georgia's, uh, as Georgia's Governor Brian Kemp is rapidly reopening the state, I think has reopened the state. Michelle Miller is a co-founder of coworker.org. Coworker provides uh, technology and social networking tools, advice and support to tens of thousands of gig workers to help them organize workplace campaigns all over the country, like the Starbucks baristas who advocated for stores to close and many grocery store workers who are demanding hazard pay and protective equipment. George Gale directs National People's Action, which is a coalition of more than 50 organizations all across the country advocating for working and poor people. Recently, People's Action has been organizing around the idea of a people's bailout as part of a just recovery from COVID-19. So we have about an hour uh, this afternoon. It's a brief conversation. So I'm just gonna ask the panelists some questions, uh, just a handful of questions, and then we'll leave plenty of time for discussions and questions from the audience. So if you have questions and, or thoughts as our conversation proceeds, just please type them into uh, the, the entry window in your uh, YouTube uh, screen as it goes on. And then we'll pick those up in, in the Q&A and discussion. So uh, the first question is for uh, Latasha. So Latasha, all over the country, states and communities of color, uh, states and communities are considering when and how to reopen. Georgia is at the leading edge of this reopening, probably the first state in the nation to go as far uh, as they have in, in starting up all the businesses and workplaces. As of last week, nearly every business is free to reopen. I imagine that people's, people in communities that you're organizing have mixed feelings about this. People need to go back to work to get income, to put food on the table and pay for the rent. But at the same time, they don't want to get sick and they don't wanna get their families and loved ones sick. Can you tell us what people you're working with saying they need in this moment? And how is Black Voters Matter organizing to help make sure that people can get that? So, you know, it's interesting. There's one phrase that um, a worker at a poultry plant said to us, and, it's, and it sticks with me. He says, I want to work. I just don't want to die. And I think that that puts it all in context, that people want to work. People want to continue. All of us have a urge to continue with what, what is normal for us. We want to go work. We want to go shopping. We want to go to the beach, you know, but there is a health crisis that has shifted that that creates a new normal. And so for us to continue to operate as if 
you know, we could just go pick back up on our lives because that's what we desire to do um, without literally just lending that at the end of the day, nature really has a way of being stronger than we are, right? And so we've got to yield to that. And so what we've been hearing from people um, is this, this, this mixture, this one, yes, I want to go back to work, but then two, um, I've, I'm, there's an uh, a incredible amount of anxiety and fear um, for the health and safety in that process. And so given to that, for the most part, most of the people that we've been talking to in our, um, in our community have experienced on some level the devastation, been touched by it, and absolutely want our governors and our government to really respond accordingly to that. And so as a result, there have been several what Black Voters Matter has been doing is twofold. So one, we know that it's important that we address what is at hand now. So while we do a lot of power building work and there's an election coming up, we've got to deal with what's at hand now. And so we've organized, readjusted and organized all of our work into three buckets. And so one bucket is really dealing with COVID-19. Right now in the short term, we're providing mutual aid support, um, funding, we're helping organizations, grassroots groups that are distributing masks and sanit um, sanit uh, sanitizer, as well as groups that are some groups that are doing more service oriented work around working with seniors and what have you. But then we've got the second bucket, which is our voter education, our voter protection work and voter mobilization work. And then our third bucket, which we call Black Love, um, Black Love and Power, which is really our work and around culture, our culture work to keep people that when people are in the midst of a pandemic, that hope still is needed that when folks are traumatized that you still need this space of hope. And so those are kind of how we've organized our three buckets. I'll just highlight some of the specific things that we've done on um, most recent kind of related to those buckets. In our first bucket, uh, we've provided, we've set up a special fund. It's called the Saving Our Sales Fund that we started with a seed of $150,000. We'll probably go up to around $250,000 where we're providing emergency rapid response grants to grassroots groups in our states. We work in 11 states, um, in the, mostly in the South and with Pennsylvania and Michigan. So we're doing a lot of that work. We're also providing technical assistance and support on that. And then another big movement piece of that, um, which goes to our, my second point, uh, is really dealing with alliances, like building alliances. So we are working with three other networks, Southern networks, uh, the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative that has a network in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, also in the Southern Movement Assembly that has a network in 11 states in the South and the Highlander Center, which most people will know um, is very historic, has a, has a long history of serving the Southern community. And we have come together as an alliance to make specific demands on the Southern governors. And there are six demands, we could talk about it later and, um, and I'll share more around that later, but that's one of the pieces that we're doing. Um, the second piece in the voter, edu in the voter protection and mobilization pieces, we filed a suit. So we filed a suit against the state of Georgia around postage that that um, for the absentee ballots, the postage wasn't provided. And so that in itself, we see that as a, 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 a poll tax and another barrier. Um, we've also been organizing around protesting some of the regular pieces. The, the challenge in a pandemic is racism doesn't stop. It actually, and oftentimes is exacerbated. And so now we're faced where there is a video that some people may have seen of a young man that was shot, was like tracked down almost like a dog because he was jogging in a community. And that happened in Brundage um, and Georgia, in Southwest Georgia. Um, and so there's some organizing happening around that as well. And then the third, and then on the third piece, we've been doing community briefings. So just like the president is having briefings, we've been doing community briefings and we've assembled a panel of experts um, that uh, experts should really be able to give on updated information to our community in real time. That's great. La uh, Latasha, can I ask you one follow-up question? Is that um, in this moment where, you know, you can't knock on doors, you can't have meetings in church basements, are you finding that your organizing is mostly about mobilizing and getting people who've already were in your network and your organizations to do additional work? Or do you find that this is a moment in which you can reach out to new people who you haven't been or who haven't been organized and who aren't members of your organizations and networks yet? Yeah, it's both. You know, I think it's interesting that oftentimes there are um, organizations that operate as if the canvassing in itself is organized, that's the magic. The canvas is just the activity, right? It is, it really, the, the, the organizing is rooted in the relationship building. Mm 
And so what the way that we have been building relationship has been very transformative in that framework and not transactional. What I mean by that is we're not the group that just goes and knocks at doors and leaves a pamphlet and go on about our business, right? I, I don't even know if I think that that's an effective form of organizing, quite frankly, right? What we do is we actually build networks and grassroots groups. So there's two things. So one is around strengthening the network that we have. So somewhere in our network, there are about 200 grassroots organizations in the 11 states that we work with that now being able to, we've just had to shift how we're communicating with them, right? And be able to give them information, strengthen them, be able to provide some resources, capacity building resources. But then two, because there is a particular need and, and anxiety around communication, it actually provides the opportunity for people who normally would not engage us to engage us when we're doing community briefings. We had a community briefing, um, our first community briefing, we didn't know how many people we would have on it or to participate. We planned it in less than four days. And as a result, we had over 7,000 people to tune in onto it. That's the hunger in community of getting information. Actually, it's around 7,500 people. My, my, my point is it's also providing, you know, the magic isn't in the activity of just the canvassing, it's in the contact, con you know? And so what we've had to do is shift our tools and how we communicate with people. So we're using, we're more on radio, we're using radio more. We're using the internet more. Um, we've actually had to build out and expand and is still doing that. Our digital campaign, right? This was a component. This was like a component to support our canvassing. Now we've had to shift our focus to literally on our online, on the online platforms. So it does two things. So one, it's around shoring up and making sure we're building the capacity of those that are already in our network. And then two, also being a service provider of information and communication to those that actually provide the opportunity to expand our organizing network. That's great. And maybe we'll come back to that a little later. I mean, uh, I think that information is good information is in kind of short supply right now, reliable information. And, and it feels like uh, all three of your organizations are doing some things that you weren't doing uh, before the pandemic, like the mutual aid work, and maybe also providing reliable information. You don't think of that usually as a job of social movement groups, but maybe it's becoming that. Um, next question is for George. Uh, George, so People's Action is a coalition of dozens of community organizations of working and poor people all over the country. I have a couple of questions about how the pandemic's changing your work. First, how have the goals of the campaign changed, if they have, right, the campaigns that you're doing? Is it pretty much the same goals that you're seeking, but under different conditions, or has the pandemic kind of put new goals on the table for you and your organizations? And uh, if so, what are those new priorities? Is it healthcare, employment, basic needs, the mutual aid, other things? And then second is a question, kind of like my follow-up to Latasha, how, how has the organizing work changed? You can't go to door to door, you can't do house parties. How are you able to continue the basic work of relational organizing when you can't get physically proximate? Yeah. Great questions. Loving this conversation. Um, so I guess I would say everything's changed. Like the entire operating <laughs> framework we're working from has shifted. And there's an organizing axiom I grew up with, which is all organizing is reorganizing. And the idea being that communities and powers organized in a specific way right now, and that way is rarely beneficial to the people that we work for and organize with. And our jobs as organizers that come in and reorganize the community and reorganize power relationships in a way that's more humane, fair, and generative. This is the ultimate reorganizing moment. Um, these crises, as we know really well, create incredible moments of danger. We're seeing that every day. I don't, I don't need to go into the details around that. And then they also just kind of open everything up and suddenly a bunch of stuff's on the table um that wasn't just two months ago and, th and those could be bad things like speeding up the consolidation of corporate power big unchecked bailouts and so many things and then ideas uh, and policies that we care about meaning making that we care about is also on the table so it's the ultimate reorganizing moment and we feel like everybody in our organization suddenly has a different job than they had two months ago um and i think like in terms of your getting right to your question archon like i think We've run everything through, you, we need a demand shift, a strategy shift and an organizing shift. Like the old demands don't make sense in the same way. They're probably connected to the same North Star we were pointing for. Um, but some of the things we might've been fighting for over 10 years, we think we need to win now. So just as examples, like 
Um, you know, there's a long-term fight for Medicare for All is the thing many people are involved in. And there's a fight right now to win emergency Medicare for All in the next month. So the old demands don't make sense anymore. And we have to keep, I think we'll have to refresh them over and over. And we keep telling our organizers, like, we're going to refresh them, but like, don't think this is going to, this is it. And secondly, like you got new demands, you got to have new strategies. The old strategies don't apply. Um, many of us were not operating in a context of moving federal legislation two months ago. It just wasn't a thing that was going to happen with this mm -hmm. current federal makeup we have. Suddenly a ton of stuff's in play. And then to get to the organizing question, like, this context requires like a whole new way of thinking about organizing, but I do think some of the core fundamentals still apply. There's just some, some differences. So, um, and we think, I think a couple of key differences are like, what are the on ramps, which we're always thinking about what are the on ramps that bring people into organizing? And then what are the tools that we need that are different? So an old on ramp that we're quite used to is door knocking or like uh, you know, face to face one-on-one -on -one at a, a church or a coffee shop. We just have to adapt to new on-ramps. Um, and what we're finding is that, and also people need different things. And this applies in organizing pre-COVID and now, like some people need mutual aid, some people need emotional support and connectivity, and some people cope by moving to action. And that's what they want. So we're trying to run all of our organizing through that kind of lens. And people, everybody's coming in for the project of building power, but what's gonna bring them in is different. And then finally, like one little adaptation that we've done that I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised has worked well. We ran a test toward the end of last year in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Michigan to see if basically 15 to 20 minute conversations on the doors that were kind of grounded in radical empathy and listening might be able to move people who are anywhere from conflicted to regressive on immigration through a deep conversation, not a judgmental conversation, not a debate, not throwing facts at people. Um, and we teamed up with folks from uh, UC Berkeley and Yale to kind of run the metrics around that and had a significant change rate in people's views of, of immigration, of immigrants and the idea of immigrants accessing public benefits. And, and those numbers stuck for months. People actually that, that 15 to 20 minute conversation had a big impact on people we are now shifting that to the phones and are pleasantly surprised at how many people will engage us on the phones. We think that part of that is the context of COVID and people being kind of cooped up. But so everywhere in our organization, and I'm sure with Latasha and Michelle and everybody, we're just we're building on what we know and then trying to adapt it to this moment. That, that's great. So the on the last part, the deep conversations, that's that's you're deliberately not trying to persuade people. You're just you're trying to listen. Well, no, no, we are trying to persuade people. <laughs> we are trying to persuade. Um, but we think there are ways to persuade people and there are ways to persuade people and coming to your door and telling you like you don't get it or getting into a bait with somebody and like it doesn't work. But and this is actually built on the deep canvassing model that was used to propel progress around gay marriage. It was used in California, it was used in Minnesota and other places. And we wanted to see if you could do it around an issue that is that is clearly a racialized issue and see if you could move people just to say 20 to 25 percent of the electorate supports public health care raising the minimum wage getting money out of politics and then you start to talk about immigrant rights and get a little fuzzy there and so so we feel like that's a key constituency that we need to be talking to so but yeah. but but we are definitely the goal is to move people but not move people by insulting them or or getting into a heated debate right Gotcha. And uh, already a, a question from uh, David Wood in the audience, and I'll, I'll just direct this to you, George, um, but it could uh, apply later on to Michelle or Latasha. Um, David, uh, hi, David, in the audience. David asks, how do you go about generating the new demands? Like, how did you figure out that it had to move from what you were fighting for pre-COVID to emotional mutual aid action pressing feds the, at the federal level, which you hadn't been accustomed to, like, how does that? Same way we do everything we asked our members, like we have campaign cohorts that are made up of our local folks. And so we take it, I mean, the demands we had came out of that group, the demands we'll have go there. So we go to people, what, what do you need to get through this moment? What, if the old housing demand was X, what do you need? So one of our big pushes is around, uh, Congresswoman Omar's bill around rent and mortgage cancellation, like that came out of our folks. Then we got our folks involved in helping write the bill. Um, so we always go back to our folk. 
because if, if we're serious organizers, that's what we do. Yeah. So I would say that. And then like, we also, you know, we see what's the best adaptations happening in our people's action family. And we go, damn, that looks good. Like, let's do that in more places. And we bring it to other folks like that. And so I don't know if that, that makes sense, but. No, that helps a lot. I did, I didn't know that, uh, that, uh, Congresswoman, that, that you guys were, had some input into that important proposal and piece of legislation. Yeah, yeah. If anybody's motivated to call their member of Congress, we would love it because. <laughs> I'm sure lots of people in the audience are. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, so uh, third question is for Michelle. Uh, so Michelle, uh, for folks who don't know, you should definitely check out coworker.org. It's a really fresh novel approach. It's been going for a while, but um, Michelle doesn't really begin from the same kind of uh, community organizing approach uh, that uh, is the kind of tradition of George and Latasha. Uh, Michelle's focused on providing tech tools and different kinds of support for I don't know what to call it exactly, new economy workers to help organize. And you guys have touched many, many people in many different kinds of workplaces. And then I think it's fair to say that more of coworkers' campaigns are focused on the employer and workplace relative to city, state, or federal government. So that's a, another kind of difference um, by way of context. Um, so uh, Michelle's trying to help or workers organize their workplaces, whether it's a Starbucks, a grocery store, inside their own cars, if they're uh, rideshare uh, folks. Um, so Michelle, can you give a sense of one or two campaigns that have started with coworkers help since the pandemic began? And what are some of the successes and challenges that you've encountered so far? I know that um, a lot more people out there are interested in coworker um, since the pandemic, but it's so if you could just give people a sense of, of the work. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, Coworker was created um, with the intent that if we reduce as many barriers to organizing as possible, we will build communities of folks who have direct experience with collective advocacy and start to build those muscles around organizing that are so important to revitalize the labor movement. Um, and by creating this kind of open platform, we ended up being a hub of worker organizing, many, many people organizing for the first time in their lives in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so just for context that we had within the first month, more than 250 campaigns launched by workers inside their companies. Um, and uh, in addition to the existing folks on the platform, um, 300,000 new workers joining in just the course of one month. Um, and what we saw were some, some key trends across um, uh, multiple sectors around demands that workers were making. Um, and uh, the, first, the first set of demands were really around paid time off. Um, most of the people who use coworker.org work in food service, retail, gig, logistics, low wage industries where access to paid time off is um, pretty rare. Uh, and in some cases, folks won that paid time off, but I'll say that with an asterisk that I'll get back to later. Um, we saw um, grocery workers really leading the charge and setting a minimum standard around hazard pay. And that those are uh, workers at regional chains like HEB in Texas and um, Oregon's Market of Choice where they won um, hazard pay really rather quickly in the early days of the pandemic and also at national chains represented by the UFCW like Kroger and Safeway where they also uh, won hazard pay. And then we had a set of, of campaigns that um, we were very interested in where workers were challenging their own boss's assertion that the, um, that the business was providing essential services. Um, they were saying, you know, I work at Staples, which is an office supply store, or I work at a smoothie place. And the, the, what we are providing the community is just not essential and we should close these places down. Um, and the most successful of those campaigns uh, were Starbucks baristas who won closure of cafes um, for a month with pay. And so, you know, we saw a ton of this activity emerging. We saw many networks at employers that we have never had networks at emerge overnight. You know, Taco Bell now has uh, one of the largest employee networks on coworker.org in response to the fact that they've been promoting a free Taco Tuesday during the pandemic. Um, and literally encouraging people to come to the store, putting people in danger. 
Um, 80,000 postal workers who've been begging for basic access to PPE uh, while they're working their routes. And when we think about that in the context of the coming election being conducted by mail, um, you can imagine how, how critical that is gonna be. Um, and what we're also seeing happening in those networks now after this sort of first wave of immediate demands is really examining like what have workers won in their workplaces and are those new policies actually useful? And I wanna, I wanna really zero in on that um, and, and talk about um, uh, Publix, the Southern grocery store chain where we have a number of folks, we've had 13,000 folks join a campaign for hazard pay there. We also have a number of campaigns at Publix. Um, and uh, I, I wanna tell the story of a worker that I think is quite, that it is quite illustrative of what we're hearing across grocery chain. So there's a woman in Georgia um, who works in the deli department at Publix. She, um, in the first weeks of the pandemic had been told, you know, everybody was told if you feel any symptoms, go home. Uh, and so she started feeling symptoms. Her brother and sister-in-law had been diagnosed. She did what the responsible thing was, was she went home. Um, and she got tested and it turned out that she didn't have COVID-19. And so as a result of that, she was no longer eligible for the paid time off that she was told to take in order to stay home and protect her coworkers because that paid time off was predicated on a positive diagnosis for coronavirus and no other illness. And, and what I wanna talk about in terms of that, those kinds of policies is that um, when we narrow the scope of protective policies and social welfare policies. And when we start to make categories of the deserving and the undeserving, number one, we know that the categories of deserving and undeserving in this country fall along racial lines. Um, we know that they limit the impact of social welfare policies to actually do what they are intended, their stated purpose to do, which is to protect everybody. Um, and they leave people like this employee completely in a lurch. So she has to go back to work uh, she works in Delhi, so she's not allowed to wear a mask. She's in Georgia, where, as Latasha has explained, the entire state is reopening. She has no paid time off, and she's just got to go to work every day. Um, and there, there are thousands of workers who are coming to us with those same stories. Um, we have another employee at another grocery chain in Indiana who um, explained that um, after she used her paid time off to care for her husband who had COVID, she asked if she could use disability uh, in order to, um, in case she gets sick and later on, because she only had two weeks of PTO, and they said they accused her of double dipping and trying to take advantage of the system. And so again, like I, you know, that it, it's all of these policies that are really predicated on the presumption that they are going to be defrauded, as opposed to the um, the impulse to provide for um, large groups of people. So one of the things that we are that we are kind of shifting to right now. Um, in supporting the networks that have emerged on the platform is in those, that accountability work and really digging into the nuances of like, how are the policies that are being implemented actually impacting workers' lives and are they able to get to the people who need to put them to use? And what is the organizing that workers need to do and the information sharing that workers need to do? Because often we're, the, the way that this is communicated back to workers is really punitive. It puts the blame on them. It says that they messed up or broke some rule in some way, and that's why they're not able to access it. And so if you, if you start to share the stories across the networks of the same thing happening over and over again, workers start to identify these as patterns and not um, anomalies. Uh, and the la sort of the last, the last thing I'll say is that we're also doing a lot of thinking about what unemployed worker organizing looks like right now because with 30 million people so far who have actually been able to contact their unemployment offices um, and many, many others unemployed, what are the demands that groups of workers and what are the formations that groups of workers can be operating under to ensure that we are protected over the long term and to again, address a system that has been built on humiliation and punishment uh, to be reimagined as something that actually serves people in moments of crisis and moments of unemployment going forward. That's great. Thank you very much, Michelle, for that. Um, so uh, I want to visit a theme that's been emerging a little bit in the questions that are people that people are asking on the chat, and that's about tactics. And so if you guys could talk about, um, I'm going to ask a tactical question, but then say how that fits into your relational organizing and campaigning strategies, right? And so the the initial uh, kind of question, uh, there's a couple different version of it is. 
One, is a particular tactic more effective right now um, in your initiatives like texting versus phoning versus email? Um, so are you finding which tactics are having more or phone calls um, having more uh, question, uh, traction? And then a related question is uh, from somebody who is an active political texter. Um, he or she says, over 100 texters in our group and action hours, they, they have action hours that they text political texts every week. They're organized to do that. And he or she asks, how can these folks be most effective in COVID issues? So how would you, if you had 100 texters, you know, doing an hour a week each, how would you deploy them? If at all, maybe you think that's not so useful in relational organizing. I don't know. Well, let me just say, I've got plenty of work for those hundred texters. So if you, <laughs> I'm going to go on and put my bid out that we have plenty of work for hundred texters um, because we're, and, I, and, I, and I'll specifically talk about a text campaign, which is really related um, in some ways to Michelle's work and around the workers. So let me just say that, that in terms of tactics, anybody that tells you that they got the foolproof plan of know exactly what, what to do right now, they're lying. They're just not being honest. The truth of the matter is we're all in flux right now. We're all trying to figure out the settling of it. You know, e even, even this whole notion of just like pushing through and let's get back to normal, there is no normal, right? And so even that is a facade. So part of what has to happen, and even in this space, um, we've allowed, as an organizer, I have to be experimental. I have to be innovative in this moment. I have to even stretch myself from ways that I know, and I think George um, um, mentioned this earlier, I have to stretch myself in ways and try multiple tactics, right? Because we're still trying to figure out what works, what's effective and what's not effective. What we do know is that um, early on what, you know, in the midst of when the crisis first hit, let me just give um, a couple of quick examples around some tactical pieces that um, we had to adjust. So when the crisis first hit, we were in, we were literally dead center in our census work, right? That part of what we were focused on were two things. One, our census work and upcoming primaries. And several of the primaries, we work in 11 states and several of those states, the primaries were coming up in the next week or so, right? And so some of those, so our whole model was around, our messaging was around get out the vote and it was around census. Here comes along COVID-19, right? People don't, in the midst of that, folks didn't want to hear about voting and people didn't want to hear about census, right? And so in some ways, what we had to do is we had to adjust, um, we had to adjust our messaging Right, we had to adjust our messaging, some of our tactics in terms of. If I remember one of our groups that we worked with in Michigan, they were, we didn't know, they were still a group that we're supporting, they were still going out canvassing. And we were like, well, what, what are y'all doing? Why are you canvassing? And they was like, well, we're, we're staying safe away. Um, but because they were afraid that they were going to lose funder, funding mm -hmm. from their grant tour. And so, which is also a real piece for folks. Yeah. And so we had to literally realize that at that moment, we needed to get information to even our network so that they had the proper information of what was safe and what was not safe, right? There were people even in our network that were doing feeding programs, but were not really thinking about kind of the safety implications around that, right? Particularly grassroots groups that have information that are used to responding when there's a crisis. So there's a number of things in terms of tactics, I'll say that, that we, that worked well for us. One, similar to what George said, what some of this, I would say we realized in COVID-19, but some of this we realized over the years around um, having an engaged listening strategy has worked. That has been from our, our first three, year, our three years of operating. And so part of what we realize is that the robocalls are not that effective unless you're just giving information around meet us somewhere. It's just basic kind of um, agnostic information. And so a couple of tactics we had to do. One, one tactic actually in terms of shifting and creating supporting mutual aid is a tactic. Right, that to not show up for communities when they're in, in a mm. critical need, right? We have to see that we're not a social service organization. That's not who we are. That's not who we're trying to be, right? We're not disaster relief. We're not a, even a funder in that sense, right? But we had to we but we had to shift and use it as a tactic. One, because it was a need 
for a community as being a good organizer, you have to meet what the need is. And so that's what we were hearing, what was the need. And so that was one strategy, like literally being able to support and gird up the mutual aid. The, the second piece is around texting and phone banking. So one, we're using text messaging and we realized that there were a lot of data. And some of the, organiz some of the organizations early on, we found out that in, in many cities, um, uh, some of the black health, some of the, the health clinics were in black communities. I'll give one an example. We were working with one in Kalamazoo that has a base of 43,000 people. They see 782 people a day. They were given 52 tests for the duration of the COVID-19. Like, let that sink in. Right. And so um, at, we almost had to almost operate quasi almost in government form, had a team and found tests. And so we literally became a distributor and a, connecting them to a supplier and a distributor to, to make sure that those that tests were given in that area. My point is that was kind of the, the, the mutual aid piece that we had to adjust the tactic around using the text messaging in that process what we realized is people were experiencing that but it was that data wasn't collected anywhere right and so we actually connected it to a bot where when people text they actually would have a question there were a couple of questions that they answer and it and it comes back to us and then so then we had data we're also using it as a tactic i'll give another just quick example um a tactic of we're working with black voter um black workers um in the state of virginia that there are 10, there are 10 poultry plants in this one area in the Northeastern shore. Um, there are two plants in particular, one that deals with 200, 2 million birds, right? So that's a lot of chickens. And, and, and in those plants, about 55% of the, 55 to 60% of the population are African-American workers, they're Latino workers, um, um, white workers, and also Haitian workers in that area. But people are so afraid that there's not organized, they're not unionized, and we were yeah. getting information. And so what we were able to do is use the text messaging to really be able to get information so people could remain anonymous, but that we could collect data to say that this is what the workers want, or this is what we need to do. And so we use the text messaging as a strategy to get information that doesn't require a lot of engagement. We're just trying to get some hard data quickly. And then I'll let the last thing I'll say is in, the, in terms of the telephone calls, as like George said, part of that is that's the best we have right now for the canvassing piece, like to engage in conversation. And we've been finding the same thing that George is. People are not interested in your script, that people want to be listened to. <laughs> and so, so in that process, even, even in our script, we're saying, this is a check-in call. We want to see how are you doing? Right, and then be able to provide resources and to hear from that. And so even in the way that we're conducting the call is really around a tactic. There's a particular tactic in terms of having people to engage you in, in, in particular ways. And so there's a mirror of other things. I just wanted to highlight those were some specific tactics that we've had to adjust and use in, in light of COVID-19. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask all three of you about the receptiveness of either allies or employers or political leaders to a pro the progressive social agenda that you're advocating now in the pandemic. And so what I mean is I'm, I'm a little bit confused about this because you see two different things happening, right? In the pandemic, you see some employers, some politicians, um, some advocates exploiting the pandemic, the conditions of the pandemic to make inequality actually worse and things less just, you know, so uh, using the pandemic and the reason of essential work to uh, fire people who speak out about lack of PPE or who try to organize at work, right? So that's a way in which you can use the pandemic to advance an unjust agenda, at least unjust in my view, right? But then you, you could, you see also some sympathy and more possibility for progressive alliance, right? So uh, maybe what I want to know is for Michelle, for employers that you're working with, what's how's the divide there? Are some more sympathetic to the plight of the workforces that are really under a huge amount of pressure now? And for Latasha and George, for politicians that you're trying to influence, do you see some who would have been a little bit more skeptical about? Well, one example is the the 
uh, basically everybody's for a UBI, at least in Congress during the pandemic, right? Everybody's in the Yang Gang now, at least for a few months. You wouldn't have expected that before the pandemic, right? So maybe in some ways there's a more open ear to a social justice agenda. So how does that play out, the resistance versus the openness and more possibilities for alliance? Maybe Michelle, uh, for like the employers, what do you see? Yeah, um, I mean, at employers who have a tradition of listening, uh, we are seeing a response from those same employers. And for employers that do not, um, we are not seeing that. And I, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't actually, I, I'm sorry, but I have not seen an added openness um, to, <laughs> uh, to the, to worker needs and worker, I, what I have seen is increased organizing from workers and a media environment where workers are being treated as experts on the economy and what's happening on the frontline economy like never before, and an ability to build out information and narratives and stories about what's happening so that there's enough pressure on employers to actually shift some of these policies. I mean, that, that's what we're really, I think that's what we're really seeing. And, um, and we have seen that be successful. I mean, the fact that we all know that PPE, hazard pay, and paid time off are the three most critical um, uh, needs right now is the result of effective organizing and communications from frontline workers themselves. Um, and so, you know, I, I there, and I, I think that well-intended employers, and there and definitely there are, and people who are trying to put in policies to respond to the moment are hamstrung by an inherent logic that says, again, as I mentioned before, that when people try to access benefits, they are probably defrauding you and you, they, are, they are guilty until proven innocent on that. And when you, when you set up benefit systems and welfare, social welfare, based on that assumption, instead of based on a universal good or a universal care, then you have already backed yourself into a corner in terms of actually being able to adequately respond to what people need. If we built systems of social welfare and paid time off predicated on the basic idea of when someone says they need something, believe them. When someone says they're sick, just believe them we would be in a much different circumstance. And so I, I think that because of the logic of those systems that, that, that do the opposite, even employers who are well-intended around policies that they're, that they're uh, pushing are not actually able to meet the intention of those policies. Yeah, good, good. I think uh, one, one democracy, small d democracy point that I wanna highlight in this discussion that's I think all, all three, George, Latasha and Michelle are agreed on this point is you can only realize what the agenda is by asking people who are affected. And we wouldn't know that it was hazard pay, uh, immediate mm -hmm. Medicare for all, PPE, sick leave. If it weren't, you know, these are the things that people are saying kind of loud and clear. And the only way you can know is by actually listening. Um, good. Yeah. George and Latasha, what are you seeing on the political side? Are alliances easier to make? Is it more headwind? Mm -hmm. Just one quick thing. I mean, I feel like this all comes down to power. Like that's, uh, nobody's just going to sell them to be more open. It comes down to power. And uh, I think actually what we're seeing exposes the gaps in power. I feel like, and I'm on a little bit of a rant on this. So you can just shut me off at a certain point, but like we've got a galvanized left in the U S and, 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 and an amazing left Twitter. I mean, some active people on Twitter and it's, and God bless that. And I'm on Twitter, but like, we you are just seeing the ceiling in terms of this galvanized left and there is lots of good organizing happening in this country but we are just not organizing enough everyday poor and working class people that honestly could give a shit about left twitter and i i just think i think this is actually a moment for a call for a like renewed multiracial poor and working class organizing drive and i could go into some of the reasons i think philanthropy has played a role in that i think the heavy focus on absorption, which I get, and, I, and we do it too. But it just, you know, I grew up in a kind of organizing, we just knocked on doors in the neighborhood, asked people what they cared about, and then we worked on that. But now there's actually more money in organizing than there's ever been. But the percentage of it that's to go ask people what they care about is, is so low. It's usually somebody cooked up some stuff somewhere in DC or New York or something, and then they, they see if we'll do it. And I think that is not going to build the base you need. And so I think we're seeing right now, if we can't move enough people to either pressure Dems to fight harder, or we can't move Republicans to include a little more of our stuff, it's just going to be a tough, 
tough road to hoe for people. And, you know, I mean, just, I'll just be honest. I, my aunt Alma always said, you can't put lips, lipstick on a pig and you can't put lipstick on the current version of what we got in power. And so I think, and I would just say back to the tactical question, like, I think, that I hope we're all asking, and, and I know Latasha and Michelle do this, and we try to, like, we can bring all kinds of people in, but are we bringing people in that are already with us? Or we bring people that are just kind of like checked out or don't have any faith that engaging in civic life or organizing works. And I think we got to do that. And we, I think we actually have a huge opportunity now. We did a lot of work uh, in the fallout of the financial crisis. And suddenly tens of millions of more people were open to a conversation around what was happening in the country. And millions of more people were open to organizing. We're in one of those moments. I just hope we do it through a lens of bringing in lots of new people not just switching where the converted hang out and spend their time. Yeah, that's, that's uh, so such an important point. And it ties into a question from the audience and a, a broader family of questions like how can people who aren't in poor and working class communities of different kinds, like I think probably a bunch of people on this chat are not, right? Um, how can we be allies? What can we do that would help your efforts move forward in addition to tweeting, which I regularly do, and then there's a, a specific version of that that's about philanthropy um, from uh, Kelly uh, in the audience. How has philanthropy stepped in to help and how can they help more? And George, I think your point is really well taken. I've been myself you know, and lots of my students have advised different philanthropies on what would be this bang up program that would really move the ball forward that actually makes your guys' lives a lot harder because it imposes creates all kinds of strings on the money, right? So if you could create the strings on your own money, you know, what are the strings like and, and what should it be like? What, how can philanthropy be more helpful in this moment when there's so much help needed? Who are you Anybody? asking? Anybody? Yeah, okay, Latasha, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I just rambled on. I'll let Latasha. <laughs> I thought I thought you you were on a roll. So I, if you want to uh, start on it, I can I can pick I'll, up. You were I'll saying. say we're just one. I mean, I think a shift towards funding that is actually to go ask people to start the the old organizing truth. Start where people are at, and we and we got we got a little bit of money after Trump got elected to go into some rural majority white but multiracial communities that had swung from support to Obama to Trump and in many cases 20 to 25 percent and there wasn't much of it this money there wasn't just a little bit but we did get an agreement that all we're going to go do is go talk to people we asked them three questions what issues do you care about what do you think the solutions are which was our effort to not project because they say health care that they mean public health care and we're not going to project the public progressive idea on them and then who and what do you think is responsible and we say, all we're going to do is go do that and tell you what people said. And then we're going to organize people. But we organized on what people said they wanted to work on. And I think you now have a generation of organizers that have been trained to be mobilizers, not organizers. And yeah. so, and I think it, it, it is a little bit of a go slow to go fast. But that one shift would, I think, would have a, a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. Good. And, and so, um, I, kind of more to the second question, but I, I, I just want to... Um, the, the part of, and perhaps this is answering the question, I'm not sure if it is or not, but it's kind of how, I'm, I'm like you, George, it's kind of like how my mind is operating. You know, I think we have to think of this, there's a rapid response period, there's a short-term period, right, that we know that there's a, a major election, particularly when we're talking about in the context of democracy, that's happening in seven months, and then there's a long-term, right? And so part of what I, I, I feel like, this is my, I know um, Archon has heard me several times talk about my theory around Blockbuster and Netflix, right? And so um, it, there's a, there's a, um, um, I, I, I've, I've coined this other kind of thinking around what I call we're in this phantom star stage, right? And what that means, you know, most of, the time, most of the stars that we're seeing in the sky, a lot of the stars that we're seeing don't exist anymore. They haven't existed for millions of years. What we're seeing is we're seeing the light that has traveled, it's taken a million years. So we're almost like seeing the residue, like the imprint of the star, but the star is gone, it's over with. And so I really believe that that's where we are in America. We, if we don't know by now, you know, I know that I was taught that good financial planning means that you have six months, you are financially stable when you have six months of savings 
right? That can, that a minimum of six months of savings to provide for your family. America, the greatest, the, the, the wealthiest country in the world couldn't take care of our people for a month without everything breaking down. That in itself, just based on what they teach you in econ says that financially, this country is not financially stable. Right. And so that there's some the economic system itself can't even sustain. Now, I would argue it's more of a will than it is the ability, because I do think that there are resources because, you know, um, overnight they found one point five trillion dollars for the Federal Reserve. So and that that's a different that that'll be a different conversation. But I want to raise a couple of pieces around this that I think is important for us to think. And I think part of what we've got to recognize of where we all are right now is that we're all in a reorganizing space, right? That we're all in. We can get caught up in the phantom star and believe that okay, America is just we're just gonna bounce back and the market will take care of itself. We know an economist can tell us that's not the case, right? We're just prolonging the inevitable. And so I think as we're approaching organizing, even for me, I would say kind of wake up call or some things to think about is that I can't afford just to think as a reactionary around re re responding to what government is doing now. I've got to do that work because that's part of harm reduction, but I also have to think as a futurist. And so part of what we've got to push ourselves at this place, um, which I've said for years, is what is your radical reimagining of America? It is clear that there has to be a different framework for the economy. It is too volatile, right? It's too vulnerable. It is, we know this, even, even those who've been, know, who've been talking about this, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing when, one one virus comes along, right, and just just basically destroys the, the the economy overnight in some ways, right? Not destroy. I'm being a little dramatic, but you all get my point. Um, but it shows the fragility in it. The whole piece around democracy. We're at this space now, and here it is. We're saying we're the greatest. We've got the most solid democracy, and we haven't even quite figured out how we're going to run at the presidential election seven months from now. Just think about that. Just, it, just think about that, right? Here we all have a healthcare system that a virus, be it that it is a, as, as a severe virus, um, a virus, right? One virus overwhelms the system, the entire system. My point is every single system that we have, we have got to radically reimagine what it looks like. And so part of our organizing and our discussion can't just be in the context of what exists now. It has to be in a futurist thinking around what is it that we need to really be able, and we've got us in, in this crack, those of us that are organizers, we're gonna have to bust through the door on this. This ain't the time to be polite. And, and this is the moment that we've got to push the envelope on this because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of lives. We're talking about millions of lives that are impacted right now. And so the three things, you know, we've got to start thinking of like, I can tell you even in my own thinking, like in my own thinking, I am more convinced than ever that we actually need a labor party. I'm not talking about a labor union. We need an actual labor party. I, you know, um, that this is Latasha Brown speaking, right? I'll separate, right? Because there is a the 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 vulnerability of workers. And what we do know is when workers don't work, America doesn't work, right? And so it says that theoretically, but none of the systems are actually designed to support the workers. And so that there has to be a different kind of policy framework to really be able to provide and undergird a real labor, of um, um, real structures that support la the labor force. So, you know, we also need in this moment, you know, I, I am, I wrote an article about it. It was controversial in some sense. We need a shadow government. What does that mean? <laughs> right? Literally, we assembled a uh, um, people to really be able to talk to us when we've got a president who is in place, regardless of whether you are on the spectrum, Republican or Democrat, we all know he's liar, right? He lies. So when you can't even get information, correct information from, 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 from the, the highest levels of the government, where does that lead the vulnerability of people? And so on some level, we can't just make ourselves so, so vulnerable that we just go by that. We've got to really find other vehicles and mechanisms to fall into that gap in which we expect government to do, right? Then the third and the last thing, which is really more related to in terms of these systems, I'm raising this because even as organizers is what George said, that on some level, there's been a conditioning of responding 
and being reactionary to what is. And so I am, uh, we've got to have a deeper conversation to really start thinking about thinking as founders of a new America, that as we go forward, there is going to be a new normal. And what does that look like? And how do we have the systems in place to really be able to shape that? And so this is a different kind of moment um, that I think that this virus is really exposing the fragility of the systems in this country, as well as around globally of the world. And then the last thing, the last thing I say that, that I'll say is racism and greed will be the death of America. And so racism, unfortunately, you know, we think we, we look at racism and we say, um, yes, disproportionately people of color, black folks are getting impacted by this disease. The disease don't care about how much melanin is in your skin, right? Um, it impacts us because of other health vulnerabilities. But my point is, even because of that, I can guarantee you that there are more, there are, there are more white folks that I think are going to be impacted by this disease that, that your whiteness will not protect you from COVID-19, right? And so part of the relaxed um, nature of this discussion and who's vulnerable and not, racism has even colored that. And I think on some level, all of us mm -hmm. are gonna be overwhelmed and impacted by that. And so racism just doesn't impact, um, you can't just contain the results of racism just to one group of people. It will literally, undermine every single system that exists in this country and every single person in this country is impacted by racism. Yeah, very good, thank you. So if people could enter in any last comments um, uh, because we have to wrap soon, unfortunately. This is an unbelievable conversation and there's lots in the chat about praising the amazing work that all three of you have been doing. A, a huge amount of admiration from the audience and certainly from me, as you know. Um, maybe uh, the uh, for a last round, if all three of you could comment on, I don't know if you've gotten to this stage of your thinking yet. Um, I just know that in my own work, I've been trying to rea react and kind of get get my feet under me about how to how to do business in this in this new climate. But then as all three of us, Michelle, as Latasha, as George have said, this is a moment in which there's huge amounts of interest in uh, and visibility to the plight of poor and working class communities and an upsurge of organization and energy there. W what, if anything, are you doing to put, take, take advantage of that moment, put the planks in place so that that energy doesn't get lost so that you can build on it as we move from the lockdown to the whatever kind of recovery, whatever the next months look like and, and years beyond that. How do you build strength in this moment even as we're figuring out just how to get by? Um, maybe uh, Michelle and then uh, Latasha and then George, you can have the last word. Um, yeah, so this is something that has been um, on my mind, um, even a little bit before uh, COVID-19 hit, um, is that we've been seeing an enormous amount of energy around labor organizing, a lot of goodwill, a lot of a sense of possibility around labor organizing, and really recognizing that our existing institutions do not actually have the capacity to meet that demand and desire. And, and trying to be really humble about that and saying, how do we meet this moment? Because we probably have about three to four years of people really feeling like they could try something new and do something and feeling like they have entree into owning the labor movement. So how does it feel to be a part of that movement? And how does it, does it feel liberatory? Do you have the ability to assert your demands? Which I loved the way that George talked about creating spaces and movements where people are actually, you, you are following the lead of people, you are not moving people around the preset agenda that you got funded for that year. That, that, that they are able to just shape demands and build community. Um, and also where we recognize that wins are sometimes going to be really hard to come by. What are the ways in which people actually feel together and they feel that their um, involvement in mutual aid networks, that the sense of solidarity, that the ways that they are holding one another together in real time are a piece of something they wanna come back to again and again, and that they feel like that space is a, a significant and important part of their lives, a source of inspiration and solace in a really difficult time. And you know, I run a website that is a campaigns machine. 
Um, and we have had to work really hard to build our capacity over the past year to do more for folks than give them a couple of tools so that they can run campaigns. And this hits at a moment when we are investing much more deeply and, and long-term because we finally have the capacity to do that in building up um, the deep connections between people and building on what people want to do next after that moment of campaign and how they want to know one another and how they want to be together. So I, I think that's critical to sustainability over the next 22 months of this virus. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Latasha. Yeah, just to build off Michelle, ditto with everything that you said, Michelle, I'll, what I'll offer and add is that organizing, you know, the, the, uh, this country was created from an organizing action. <laughs> I can go from everything from the Boston Tea Party to the Whiskey Rebellion to the abolitionist movement. I can go down the list. That organizing is the shaping, um, will be the shaping of the nation. And so I think how the nation goes forward, I think will be, will be determined how well its citizens are organized right and what its citizens are organized around and given that i think there are kind of three major components uh, of thoughts that come to mind um one is around this leadership pipeline that right now what we need is a whole a paradigm shift around leadership that it is not good enough to just to say um that leadership comes from elected officials. A lot of the leadership that I'm seeing right now is not coming from elected officials, quite frankly. It's actually coming from organizations, NGOs, and groups on the ground, and people in communities. So I do think that there's a paradigm shift in this moment. We got to figure out how to facilitate and go with that, and even um, lift that up in ways, right? And and be able to support that. So that, I think that's one. Two, and, and I think that that leadership, people are looking for bold, authentic, and innovative leadership right now that in, in a particular kind of way, I think that there's a value in authenticity that had, we it kind of lost its sauce for a while because in many many ways, we wanted our leaders to be entertainers. And that's from Trump on down. And that's not just, that's Republicans, Democrats. We wanted charismatic, entertaining leadership, right? And so I think now when the stuff has hit the fan, I think people are really looking for authentic voices and people who are creative and thoughtful and can actually do systems change. So that's one. And so if all of our institutions should really be thinking about how are we helping to facilitate the development of that class, this new leadership paradigm, this new leadership class. The second thing I think is what I say all the time, we've got to radically reimagine America and the world as we're going forward, there's a pre-COVID and there will be a post-COVID. And no matter how much we will it to be, um, uh, everything goes on as it is, it will not. And so what that does require, I do believe, even in our organizing strategy, for us to be more futuristic, and even in our institutions, that we're not just training people based on the blockbuster model about what we've known, but are we training people for new systems, right? Are we training people for um, on, 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 on developing new systems, taking what we have and literally creating them in a way that, that serves the people. And I think the third thing is, I think that we are at a critical juncture um, of where we're facing ourselves right now. We're at this critical juncture in this country. It's a, it, it's a defining moment in this, in this country around the consciousness of America. Like, where are we going to go for um, after this, right? And so in some ways, I think that there's this, this piece around once we, you know, once folks get rid of Trump, things are going to go back to normal, right? Um, at which I, I'm not sure what the normal was or if why we thought the normal was okay. But the bottom line is that in itself is a fallacy. And we all know that, right? That it does not, that there are some fundamental systemic things, structural things that have changed in this country that also need to change in this country that we literally have to have the foresight to really see beyond even the um, November the 3rd. Great, thank you. George, over to you, last comment. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna be redundant because there's so much good stuff on what Michelle and Latasha Incredible. said. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if I just add something, I think like we're in a battle of meaning making and the meaning that most Americans take away from this will say a lot about what's possible for the next 10, maybe 20 years. And uh, we certainly, I think go back to the financial crisis, like two potential meanings was the, the right was trying to say people of color took out loans they couldn't afford and things like CRA enabled that. That was their narrative. And we were saying like, you no know, Wall Street banks and unregulated financial institutions like crash the economy, but there's a meaning making battle there. I think we won some of that. I, th I think there are things that we didn't win, but I think meaning making around the role of government, 
around healthcare infrastructure around us. I mean, sometimes when we say we're all in it together, honestly, it sounds a little bit to me like an empty slogan. I think right now it actually lands with people in a different way. So I think we have an opportunity. <laughs> and back to something that Latasha said earlier, and this is a, this is a, this is the master class in meeting making. So I'm not sure I, it, it's, it's a stretch, but I think we would be in a radically different situation right now as a country, if not for racism, like we would have nice things. We would have the healthcare infrastructure. We'd have the worker protections. We'd have the safety net and everybody would have them. But because of racism and race as a divisive tool that cuts off a set of voters from other folks, we don't have it. And if we could get some people to see that to what Latasha said, we all lose when we buy into this, that's the game changer. And to some extent, I think that is the challenge in, in building the new America that uh, I forget the way you said it, Latasha, it was great. I wish I wrote it down, but the, the founding of a new America, like I think we got to figure that out. Right. And, and I think I think we could make some headway right now. That's great. Thank you very much. So inspiring, all of you. So there's been a lot of requests on the chat to connect with you three and your organization. So what we'll do uh, within the next day or two is revise the event listing that goes out to put some contact information from the approach to the appropriate people in all three of your organizations. So whoever wants to in the audience can reach out, just check the event listing for this event and you know the video go up and, and so on. Uh, and then also there's a huge amount of gratitude from everyone in the audience and for me, for your wisdom, for your time, for your inspiration. This has been just an amazing, amazing conversation. And thank you very, very much for that. And to people in the audience, uh, we will be doing more programming for sure in the upcoming weeks on democracy, justice in this pandemic. And so if you have feedback on how this event went or other things you'd like to see, please send that to the ASH uh, email address, which will be in the event listing as well. So um, huge gratitude and thanks and admiration to Michelle and Natasha and George. This has been really, really great. And thank you everyone for your time this afternoon.